I write books, but it's not what I did for a career. I was treasurer of a company in Boston for 42 years and basically teach college in the evening. For 25 years, I did the Urban College of Boston, which is primarily Latina and African-American women getting a two-year early childhood development degree. It was something that they had to be in a matriculating program because most of them were head start workers with A, B, C, D. But after that, uh, for, for the last five years, I've actually been with the Boston University Metropolitan College Again, teaching history in the evening to primarily undergraduates, but it's not the typical 18 to 22. I can have students as old as 75 or 80. But I find it engaging and fun because the conversations can sometimes lead to people actually realizing that those of us at our age have something to offer younger people in the conversation. So in some ways, history has always been my favorite thing. And I did do five books this year. I don't know. Yes, I do sleep, but I don't know how I did it. Five books in one year, and I'll finish a book on Boston's Freedom Trail, which is due in January, but I'll finish it in December. The, two, the three books that I brought tonight are Boston's Thanksgiving Traditions, Halloween Traditions, and also a new book called Inferno, The Great Boston Fire of 1872 that destroyed all of downtown Boston. And these are good examples of the type of thing, beautifully illustrated color photographs, and I hope interesting captions and stories. But I think in some ways, history has to be something that is not only visually attractive, but it also has to be interesting. So when I was asked to do this lecture on cranberries, I thought, what better way to talk about New England's bounty? I don't know about you, but cranberry season is here, and we usually get our cranberries at a bog in Yarmouth on Route 28, which is next to Capabilities. It's a young couple, and they have this old beat-up bus that they actually provide the cranberries in gallon bags. They also have a dog that jumps to the window that not only scares my puppy, but also kind of surprises me on occasion. But cranberries are a part of our history, and in a lot of ways, throughout the 17th century, when our families actually settled what was not only Massachusetts Bay Colony, but Plymouth Bay Colony, cranberries were something that was not only a sustaining type of a fruit, but would also be something that has down, now gone into history. So I'm going to turn that like that. So when we think of cranberries, a lot of us actually think of these bags that we see at the supermarket. Often they're ocean spray cranberries, and they're usually eight ounces. But seen here, and this is a horticultural print of the 18th century, it says the cranberries are a group of evergreen dwarf shrubs or trailing vines in the subgenus Oxyconus of the genus Vicinium. Now, in a lot of ways, it just is basically something. It is part of an evergreen family. And in this instance, you can not only see the roots, which is a very easy way to propagate them, along with the leaves, the flowers, and of course, the cranberry itself. Now, throughout the 17th and 18th century, these had been cultivated, probably by Native Americans even before that point. But seen here in an early 20th century watercolor, you can see that the cranberries themselves, along with what is almost like an evergreen leaf, is something that in this way, that the name cranberry is derived from the German cranbeer. And the English translation is craneberry. And it was first named a cranberry by, in English by the Reverend John Eliot of Roxbury in 1647. I don't know if you've ever heard of Eliot, but Eliot was the apostle to the Indians. Not only he had graduated from Oxford, but when he came to New England in 1633, he became the teacher or minister of the Roxbury Meeting House. And during that time, not only did he publish the first book in North America, but it wasn't in English. It was the Bible translated into the native Algonquin tongue. And in that instance, not only did he do that and preach all of his life, but he also founded the school I had gone to, Roxbury Latin, which is the oldest preparatory school in the United States, founded in 1630, 1646. So cranberry and cranberry became synonymous. By the early part of the 18th century, we began to realize that cranberries had this mystical power 
not only were they tart and sweet and juicy, but it seemed in some ways that they had the same quality as citrus fruit, and they actually could be eaten and used in some ways to curb scurvy. Now, during that period, many women, primarily, would actually pick the cranberries. This is a watercolor from about 1810, and it shows a woman simply dressed with an apron and a basket, and she would actually begin to pick the cranberries one by one. It was time intensive, it was laborious, but during that period of time, women and children would seem to descend upon the cranberry bogs and pick whatever was growing. It was not a cultivated crop at this point. But during the period of the 19th century, many people, especially here, not only on Cape Cod, but in Wareham and Onset, would begin to actually create cranberry bogs. Now the bogs themselves needed water, but they also needed in some ways to see the things removed. And this is a wonderful etching done probably around 1872 that shows the men in the center removing sod so they could actually begin the planting of the cranberry. But you also see in some ways the whole aspect of the modernization of growing cranberries. Now cranberries throughout the 19th century were still huge amounts. It was a great part of the economy of Cape Cod. We had sailing, we had whaling, we had salt works, and of course cranberry bogs. Well in that way, many people would come out in the fall, and school would be dismissed so that the children, both boys and girls, could assist in picking and sorting of the cranberries. Seen here, the women on the left-hand side actually place them on a trough, simply dumping the bag into that area, and women would rudimentally just simply separate good from bad cranberries, and they go into a barrel. At that point, they would simply be brought to a shed and stored until they were to be shipped. But during this period of the 19th century, many times cranberry bogs, along with their pickers, would also be painted. Not just etchings, but beautiful paintings. This is by Eastman Johnson, and it's actually Nantucket, probably around 1865. And you see in this instance, again, that concept of that laborious picking of cranberries. The woman stands in the very center, she's very dominant, but you also see in this instance men, women, and children all picking. Now, in that instance, as a close-up, they're fairly well-dressed. This was something that might actually be an entire day's project, and they'd bring lunch with them. But in this way, we saw not only wicker baskets, but that the people themselves would simply take these and dump them into that trough to be sorted. During the 19th century, in a lot of ways, many cranberry picking bogs would also be lined. Now, do you see the white lines that go from left to right? This would actually be something that we would each be assigned a specific area within those lines. And we would move in unison, going further and further as we picked more and more berries. In the foreground, you can see older gentlemen. They actually have the wooden barrels in front of them. And some of the others simply hold little wicker baskets. But this was something that once they had actually filled the barrels, the men on the right-hand side would carry them on pallets directly to the cranberry sheds. But this area was important because they were now mapping out what you would be paid. It wasn't just the fact that you were paid by the number or weight of the cranberries one picked, but in that way you were in specific areas. And it was something that would continue right through to the early 20th century. This is a photograph that actually shows it in Hyannis, Massachusetts. And again, men, women, and children all in this area, along with, as you can see here, a bog that must be 10 to 12 acres. During that period, the ripening must have been incredible because even today, the cranberry bogs here on Cape Cod are vivid red, that cranberry color. And we realized in some ways that this was an all-day ordeal. During the months of basically October 15th right through to December 1st, many people would turn out. And this was a courting scene. Imagine meeting one's husband at the cranberry bog. Good story. But you see here the women in the foreground all covered with their uh, headscarves. The sun must have been intense, just like today. It was Indian summer. 
But you can also see in the distance all the people actually going to that shack, the one that would actually have the cranberry stored. But the two men here in the foreground would carry that barrel. It was 40 gallons, and it could be anything, molasses, sugar, but in this instance it was cranberries, and it was called a hog's head of cranberries, meaning that it was 40 gallons. Now, during that period, many people here in Cape Cod would actually go on to greatness in the cranberry industry. And the A.D. Makepeace Company, which was originally based in Wareham, is the world's largest cranberry grower and the largest private property owner in eastern Massachusetts and a recognized leader in the environmentally responsible real estate development and stewardship. And seen here, Mr. Makepeace was somebody who started off in a small way, but during the period of not only the late 19th century, but when his descendants continued the business into the 20th century, made Makepeace a well-known name within the cranberry industry. In this photograph by Nathaniel Stebbins, we see a steward or a manager on the left-hand side. I don't think he was doing too much bending over. But he's actually watching all of these children and women but in this instance, the photograph is quite interesting. I'm just going to say that the cranberry, along with the blueberry and Concord grape, is one of the only three native fruits grown commercially in North America. But if you look closely at this photograph, it's not native-born. We're seeing in the incidents here of Portuguese beginning to actually come to assist in the harvest. And that was something that was really quite interesting because many people were migrant workers in the fruit industry. So it's not just natives that live in the community, it's now people that will go from area to area. And seen here in a photograph, and this is actually about 1890, this child can't be any more than eight or nine years of age. She holds her wooden basket, which is her cranberry basket to hold, but she also has what is basically a cranberry scoop. Now these scoops are at many antique shops. Anytime I see them, I'm always intrigued. They're beautifully done, they've got great wood, they were usually actually even stained. But the idea here was this provided an ease of actually harvesting cranberries rather than picking them one by one. And they actually created this, and this is October 16th of 1906 when it was patented. Chandler's improved, of course, cranberry scoop. And it was manufactured by George Chandler in Marshfield, Massachusetts. Now rather than bending over and simply picking each cranberry by hand, in this instance, the cranberry bogs were now being flooded. And flooding it allowed some of the berries to actually disengage from the vines. But of course, when you scooped it, you got everything, of course, not only leaves and vines, but even the cranberries. It was a little bit more labor intensive to actually pick the various pieces. But these cranberry scoops in the 20th century was a major feature. And seen here is one, I didn't bid on it for eBay, though I thought it would be a great addition to my study. But it's a good example, as you can see, that everything was handmade. All of the individual dowels, which actually appointed, were things that were done, including the side pieces and the handle, so that you could simply scoop. So when you think of a cranberry scoop, this is basically something that now began to change how they were harvested. Well, here in a photograph, probably around 1930, again, we have a manager in the very center smoking his pipe, but we still see people actually bending over to pick them hand by hand. Not every cranberry bog allowed, of course, scoops to be used, but this was a way in some aspects to see not only how quickly it could be done, but how labor intensive. But of course, the sorting of the cranberries was a big deal. Of course, you probably got pebbles, you got leaves, vines, everything imaginable. And the child is holding a metal uh, basket, which is filled with cranberries, but each of the individual troughs would actually have these dipped into it, and they'd be checked one by one. And if you look to the left-hand side, you can see they've got four stacked on each other. Of course, these were something that wasn't going to deteriorate. 
they had a shelf life anywhere from five to six months. And in that instance, cranberries were something that was really quite fun. Well, by 1910, only four years after Chandler had created that cranberry scoop, they now began to create scoops that had handles that you could simply walk and create in that aspect the gathering of the cranberries. It was much like what we saw a rotary lawnmower that you would simply cut the grass. But in this way, the men, each one of which is holding a handheld uh, cranberry scoop, could actually do it much quicker than even just scooping it with the other. And of course here, photograph is a postcard, and this is the first instance of ocean spray that I've ever found. It dates to 1929, but it shows cran harvesting cranberries on Cape Cod. And you can see in this instance a very good way. Not only is the water creating the bogs themselves, but that the people are using, as you can see, cranberry scoops along with the troughs that would actually be used for the area to be brought to the, the shed. Ocean, stay, ocean spray was becoming big business at that point, and this was an ocean spray field in Wareham. And you see, not just the women, I love their headgear. I don't know if there were mosquitoes or something of that sort, but in any swampy or wet water areas, I'm sure they were stung. But you can see the lines actually by pieces of thin twine. So in this way, it was making it easier, but it was still labor intensive. And here, with the lined off cranberry bog, I love it. Everybody, it's almost like ready, set, go. And the people begin to crawl, picking the berries. The children and younger women usually did it by hand, but it seemed that the gentlemen would actually have either a scoop or that hand-pushed cranberry uh, scoop as well. Well, once everything had been gathered and they were placed into these troughs, they'd usually sit for at least a day or two because, again, they had to be sorted one last time. But seen here, this was something that you would then have to drag to the cranberry shacks. Usually there were horses or even oxen that would be hooked up to a small cart. But once the tallying of the cranberries took place, and that meant that basically each box was 20 pounds, but remember, the hogshead of barrel was 40 pounds, these were an important feature. A horse would actually pull the wagon, and each of these individual boxes would simply br be brought to the final refining process. And it really wasn't any different for any other cranberry bog. Whichever bog it was, and there were dozens here on Cape Cod, this is the Cape Cod cranberry industry, and this is the screen house. This was the cranberry shack. And the building itself, which had no heat, was something that would actually see all of the different carts, either by ox or horse, brought here, and we would see them beginning to be refined. And this is the screening of the cranberries one last time at a trough with women usually doing the final check. And then again, as they're put into this machine here, brought down, cleaned, washed, and then stored in barrels. These barrels, as I said, of 40 pounds could be shipped locally, and they could be taken by horse and wagon, or they could be taken to a ship in the harbor. And cranberries were known to be shipped from the Cape as far south as Atlanta, Georgia, but they were also sent on ships to the west, sent on trains to the west. But the idea here was that you saw these people working in this industry that was now employing dozens of people on a year-round basis. This machine, as you can see here, shows the interior of the screen house. And of course, once everything was screened and washed and placed into the barrels, it was big business. This was the whole concept. This was a year's harvest. And of course, during that period of late October and November, cranberries themselves would become synonymous with the autumnal season in New England. And people realized in some ways that cranberries, which grow on low-lying vines, is in permeable beds layered with sand, peat, gravel, and clay, which were originally created by glacial deposits. Commercial bogs use a system of wetlands that provides a natural habitat 
for a variety of plant and animal life. So by creating this bed, what you're doing is, yes, you're adding sand and peat and gravel and clay to augment the wetlands because sand is a major part of growing the cranberries. And we realized in some ways that they were even known by the pilgrims. Originally known as separatists, these people who were Englishmen and women went to Holland and they actually separated themselves from England. But unlike the Puritans who were members of the Church of England who wanted to purify the church from within, the separatists did not belong to the Church of England. They would eventually leave Holland and come to the New World and they settled Plymouth Bay Colony. And seen here, this is a painting of the first Thanksgiving and it was painted by Jenny Brownscombe in 1914 and is a popular interpretation of the first Thanksgiving. And it's become a symbol of the holiday for many Americans. And it reached a wide audience and influenced the national understanding when it was printed in Life magazine. Well, it's somewhat ambiguous. It shows, of course, uh, Governor Bradford actually offering a prayer. And it shows quite a few women, but we have to realize that there were only four adult women that survived the first year that would actually have participated in the first Thanksgiving. And there were very few children. But the Indians sit off in the distance, and we realize that they probably had things such as haunches of venison, as well as maybe ducks and geese, possibly turkeys. But cranberries have been known even by the Native Americans. So it might have been something that there was a cranberry sauce that would simply be almost like a chutney. Not sweet, but something savory. And we realized in some ways that it became synonymous with Thanksgiving. And this is an etching that was done by Winslow Homer. It's called Thanksgiving Day, the Dinner. And it was published in Harper's Weekly on November 27th of 1858. And you see Father in the very center carving the turkey. One of his uh, servants is just to the left. And Father carves the roast turkey and guests clink wine glasses in a toast to Thanksgiving. Notice the children's table on the right, an age-old rite of passage, where they would be seated until they were old enough to sit with the adults. But in this instance, it became a turkey dinner and with all the fixings, and it began to include cranberry sauce. Now, cranberry sauce can be chunky or smooth in this day and age, but during that period of time, it was something that was usually with sugar, chopped oranges, and rind, as well as even lemons. But during that period, the wild turkey was taking on new significance. And seen here, done by John James Audubon, this was plate number one in his monumental book, The Birds of America. And since the time of the pilgrims, the wild turkey has proliferated in America. And in his book, by attempting to paint one page each day and painting with a newly discovered technique, Audubon paid homage to the noble wild turkey that became synonymous with Thanksgiving. And it was said that Audubon was so fond of wild turkeys that he used a painting of one as the first image in his magnificent Birds of America and he also used a miniature version as his personal seal. Well, this turkey doesn't look like the turkeys we see in the supermarket, but it does look like the ones we see on the Austerville Bounstable Road on a daily basis. Turkey and Thanksgiving became one and the same. But even people, as we see here, would do things such as Uncle Sam's Thanksgiving dinner. Now, this was a very important aspect because America was changing and by the Civil War, Boston's population, which was 250,000, was actually comprised of one half that were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. So seen here, Uncle Sam's Thanksgiving dinner, which was published in the November 20th of 1869 edition of Harper's Weekly, shows Uncle Sam, seen on the upper right hand side carving the turkey, and he's standing at the head of the dining room table, and he's standing in front of a large painting of the immigrant center, Castle Garden, which is in New York. And he's carving a turkey for representatives of the diverse immigration that was taking place in the decades after the Civil War. 
It shows Native Americans, African, Chinese, Irish, German, French, Spanish, Arab, and Italian. And this is Thomas Nast, the political cartoonist, and he idealizes dinner into an all-inclusive American feat with Columbia, the symbol of America, on the left. You can see here just to the man with the Q from China and seated between an African-American man and a Chinese man. In the corners, it says, come one, come all, and free and equal. And they refer to the eclectic mixture of guests and represent the new America and his support of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. By this point, you began to realize that turkey and cranberries were synonymous with one another. And this painting, Freedom from Want, is one of Norman Rockwell's most iconic paintings, and it was part of the Four Freedom series. And it shows an elderly couple standing at the head of the dining room table as a roast turkey is placed on the table to be carved. Norman Rockwell used his own Vermont dining room as the backdrop for this famous painting, and he enlisted family members and neighbors to join at the table as models, including his cook, Mrs. Thaddeus Wheaton, who is depicted as serving the turkey. The painting appeared in the Saturday Evening Post on March 6, 1943, and since that time has become one of the most well-known and iconic images of Thanksgiving. But we see in this aspect what has become the ideal of middle-class America in the 20th century. But the cranberries came from various bogs. Did they all taste the same? Probably. They looked the same as well. But there were various brands of cranberries, and they went to the tune of hundreds. Well, seen here, this was called Eat More, which was a major cranberry bog. And it actually had Mayflower brand. That was the trademark of these Cape Cod cranberries. So in that instance, here was the Mayflower, supposedly the first ship that would actually settle Plymouth Bay Colony in 1620. But they also would realize in some ways that ocean spray cranberry sauce would also, in that instance, be something that you could actually serve. This was jellied ocean spray cranberry sauce, and it was available at the grocery store. Make your turkey taste better and better for you. But you can see that the roast turkey is on a serving tray, along with pieces of orange on which stars have been cut out of the cranberry that was jellied. It's a great example, but it says here at the bottom, it's the natural meat for turkey and every meat. Well, Ocean Spray spent a lot of money on advertising, but you even realized it wasn't just stars of cranberry. You even see how Jell-O became part of Thanksgiving. Now, don't they look like a happy crowd at Thanksgiving? Well, in this instance, you had Jell-O that was cranberry flavored. Cranberry flavored jello was something that was not only sweet but tart at the very same time. And you realize here, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, that a jellied salad could always be served. But along with the roast turkey and roasted potatoes and not only pumpkin pie and apple pie, it became a tradition. So during that period, people would actually see not just lump cranberry, but also the jellied cranberry. And look at these children, how well-dressed they are. And of course, the huge roast turkey, along with not only pieces of celery and uh, small uh, apples around it, but you see a tray of jelly cranberry sauce. Well, these two well-dressed children sit down to Thanksgiving dinner admiring a huge roast turkey ready to be carved, along with the obligatory glass tray of canned jellied cranberry sauce. Ocean Spray said that their first commercial cranberry sauce was canned in 1912 by Marcus Uran, who owned cranberry bogs in Hanson, Massachusetts. Uran developed cranberry juice cocktail in 1933 and later created a syrup for mixed drinks. And the famous canned cranberry sauce log that we know today became available nationwide in 1941. I always serve not only the jellied cranberry, but I have a dear friend, Ellen, that always brings freshly made cranberry sauce. So it's a nice juxtaposition between the two. 
And of course here, three ways to serve cranberry hearts for Valentine's Day. No longer is it just used for Thanksgiving. It's something that you could actually enjoy year-round. And it says, the finest cranberry sauce you can buy, and it was approved by Good Housekeeping and Parents Magazine. So on the left was Ocean Spray Whole Cranberry Sauce, and on the right, Ocean Spray Jelly Cranberry Sauce. But it says in this instance, cut Ocean Spray Jelly Cranberry Sauce in plump slices, six to the can, and with a heart-shaped cutter, snip a cranberry heart from each slice, and save the trimmings to spread on crackers or toast. In that instance, we realized that cranberries were becoming something that was marketed for every aspect, not just to have a Thanksgiving, but here, make peace cranberry sauce was tart enough to please, to tease, and sweet enough to please. But you can see, it was not only as a jellied cranberry, as well as a cranberry sandwich, but you had the cranberry sauce. Now during that period, a lot of ways, Eat More, which was a major purveyor of cranberries, would actually publish these things to show you how you could use cranberries in a variety of things. How about um, cranberry pie, or cranberry mold, or cranberry jelly, or even, as you see here, cranberry sauce, or even cranberry uh, meringue pie. Each thing was not only delicious, but it was allowing people to eat more cranberries. And of course, eat more was a great way to actually encourage people. But seen here, now in season, Beaton's Fresh Cape Cod Cranberries was something that not only had recipes on the back, but it said it was delicious, served with meats and poultry, and you'll enjoy it served with toast at breakfast. So in this instance, it even shows you how to make the sauce itself. A pound of Beaton's Fresh Cranberries cooked with sugar and water makes two and a half to three pounds of cranberry sauce, as you like it. And of course, there was Harvest Queen, which in this instance was the queen of the seas, and the seas were Cape Cranberries. Seen here, this was from Harwichport, and William Wheeler was a man who had bogs in Harwichport. So you realize in some ways that the gamut of what was being offered were different places and locales throughout the Cape, and of course, on Wareham and Onset, but of course, the aspect of the variety was incredible. So seen here in a series that I'm going to show you, delicious Cape Cod cranberries, and in this way it shows Plymouth and Wareham that these actually have come from an area that is actually quite common for bogs. So you have Cape Cod cranberries, you have Blue Parrot brand cranberries, and you can see this is Collie Cranberry Company, and they had distributing agents in Boston. But a blue parrot was really quite an interesting aspect. They also had Faneuil Hall brand cranberries. And Faneuil Hall, which was given to the town of Boston in 1742 by Peter Faneuil, was a great example of this place that was called the Cradle of Liberty. They also had the Bunker Hill brand cranberries. And you realize that the Bunker Hill, which was a Solomon Willard designed obelisk to actually mark the Battle of Bunker Hill, Ironically, we lost that battle to the British, was a great example, again, of another historic landmark. But of course, you had Harvard brand. And if you were a Harvard man, this trademark was something that, yes, you too would want to patronize, but they wouldn't want to offend the Yale brand. So in this way, each one of them, though they were the same cranberries, were being offered under different guises. And it was something that really worked. In a Nicholas Santa Claus brand. Now you would want this brand, of course, at Christmas time. So this was the New England Cranberry Sales Company. And of course the exchange was not only here on the Cape, but they marketed in New York as well as Chicago. So you began to realize by the period of the 1930s and 1940s, cranberries were now being actually harvested throughout the country in specific locales. But Ocean Spray was really to become the biggest. And seen here, Wisconsin Searles Jumbos shows that Wisconsin now had cranberry bogs. They also had them in Hanson, Massachusetts. So in this way, Ocean Spray was something that really cornered the market on 
advertising. And cranberries, which was something that was not only, as I said, tart but sweet, could be something in some ways that not only provided tremendous amounts of employment, but it was also a mainstay of the economy of Cape Cod and Wareham and Onset. Well, seen here, this not only had the ocean spray cranberry uh, sauce, and this building, which actually employed over 100 men and women, was a major part, and adjacent to the railroad yards that connected it to Boston, so they could send it directly to market, as well as to be distributed, either by North or South Station, or even ships. But Ocean Spray in that period of the 20s and 30s was rivaling every other manufacturer. And seen here, Ocean Spray's jellied cranberry sauce, Ocean Spray's whole cranberry sauce, an ocean spray cranberry juice cocktail was something that was now available even in local grocery stores. It was not only good, but it was said to be good for you. It was actually nutritious. And remember, it still was part of that aspect of curing scurvy. And people looked at it as something they could enjoy. Well, by the 1950s, there were these publicity shots that were done. And you can see here, these people don't look like they did the cranberry harvesting very often. <laughs> but you see a woman on the left-hand side with her cranberry scoop, and she's placing them into wooden baskets. And the man on the right-hand side is pushing a, a wheelbarrow filled with the boxes that are filled with cranberries. But these were the things that were actually shown throughout the country of people harvesting the cranberries. And of course, harvesting cranberries on Cape Cod really hadn't changed. But these were publicity shots that actually showed people the age-old ritual of actually providing them for the market. And you also see here a beautiful young woman, not only with her cranberry scoops on either side, but boxes filled to the brim with freshly picked cranberries. These were important because they'd be in nationwide magazines like Look and Life. And of course, in full color, it was something, especially during the fall season, that people would look forward to. But the surprising thing is Ocean Spray had become such a large concern. They even had these helicopters that would go from bog to bog. And you can see this man entering into the helicopter itself to go and actually check either the harvest or the actual storage of the cranberries. But during this period also, Many of these individual companies, and this is Ocean Spray, would create cookbooks. Now, everyone loved cranberry sauce. They loved cranberry juice cocktail. But how about 22 of the best fresh cranberry recipes? And you can see cranberry bread, cranberry pie, and of course pork chops, along with peaches and cranberries. Everything aspect of both sweet and savory and Ocean Spray would publish these and give them away for free so that people might actually utilize the cranberries in their cooking. But one of my favorite things that I found about cranberry was the cranberry cocktail bottle. And this was something that was in Onset, Massachusetts on Route 6 and 28 leading to Cape Cod. It was a small store and of course it had a cranberry cocktail metal bottle that was painted red to look like cranberries. And here, you could get all sorts of treats. It wasn't just cranberry juice cocktail, but you could get all sorts of different things, including frozen cranberries and ice cream. So in some ways, Ocean Spray was cornering the market, especially in the summer months when people wanted something refreshing, but also in the fall when they needed things for Thanksgiving. How about a cranberry frap? If you see on the upper left-hand side, it goes one, two, three, and four. Place a heaping spoonful of ice cream in a mixing bowl. And then fill two-thirds uh, full of cranberry juice cocktail. Beat thoroughly, and you see the beater on the lower left-hand side. I, my great-aunt, who lived with us as a child, had the same beater. And then you serve it. So it was not only delicious and frothy, but it was tart and sweet, and it was something that nobody would have thought of, a cranberry frap. Today, I've already laid in three whole cans of jellied cranberry sauce. I love it. I serve it with not only turkey, but I serve it with chicken, and I serve it with pork. But jellied cranberry sauce by Ocean Spray is something that not only has become a, a 
trademark, but it's also become a byline in some ways of the cranberry that's available. But in some ways, Ocean Spray also showed things in these advertisements. And this is for Father's Day. Let's have a chicken queue. It's not a barbecue, but it's chicken that's actually been marinated in cranberry sauce, and it's served along with slices of jellied cranberry sauce. It must have been delicious. So Father's Day, Valentine's Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, it was going on and on. Even Easter, and you see here on the lower right-hand side, an Easter bunny that's made out of jellied cranberry sauce with two eyes, which are the halves of green olives with pimento. So in this instance, with roast turkey, roast ham, it was something that became the wonderful accompaniment. But during the period, we realized Ocean Spray, which had only been founded in 1930, would celebrate the 50th anniversary in 1980. Pierpont Glass, which is actually near the Sagamore Bridge in Bourne, actually produces cup plate. And in the very center, you can see the craneberry or the cranberry, along with the crane, the bird that actually for which it was named. And in this instance, these beautifully cranberry colored cup plates would be something that you might have to place to your tea bag after you would actually let it steep in your cup. But cranberry could also be something in this instance in a nationwide magazine. Now this is a magazine that was published for the National Cranberry Association. And you can see in the foreground this man and woman hold a bag of cranberries. It's a plastic bag. And of course in the foreground is that cranberry scoop. But what's important is if you look to the left, they show the cranberries are harvested in Cape Cod, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Oregon, Washington, and Canada. And this actually at the top says that this association is serving $40 million a year as a part of the economy of the United States. So cranberries was something that wasn't just tart and sweet. It was now a major part of the food industry of the United States. And of course, they also always had a beautiful girl named the Eat More Cranberry Girl and win a new 1954 luxury Cadillac convertible. In that instance, you too could participate and possibly win a Cadillac. But this was a major part because, of course, we realized how important it was. And seen here in the 1960s, Ocean Spray Cranberry had a very comely uh, cranberry picker. I didn't see any bikinis previously, but in this instance, she wears a bikini which is cranberry colored along with waders as she stands in the water that's been used to flood. In this way, we realize what better way to actually use it as a great marketing technique. Well, seen here, again, this is probably from the late 1960s, cranberries are typically harvested in October. We flood the bogs with water and then use water reel harvesting machines that loosen the cranberries from the vine. And with smaller air pockets in their center, the cranberries float to the water's surface. And as you can see, this is exactly the way it's done today. And of course, once they're actually brought into a specific area, they go on a conveyor belt that will eventually take them into the troughs. And here, the men themselves simply rake all of the cranberries closer and closer as the area reduces the space. It's much easier, less labor intensive, and it can actually be done by three, maybe four men at a time. But we realize in some ways here that this is something that's almost 300 years of experimentation of how to basically harvest cranberries. But what do we use them for? It's not just cranberry sauce. Cranberries can be a part of our daily diet. And we realize in some ways, as we see here, ocean spray cranberry sauce can be made into a cranberry sauce that has been heated and served over ice cream. Next time it's ice cream, a sundae with cranberries, tart and sweet. But you also began to realize it could be used in our libations. And seen here, a cranberry old-fashioned was something that actually had granulated sugar, uh, bitters, 
and two ounces of rye whiskey with a splash of 100% pure cranberry juice with no sugar and added ice, orange rind and fresh cranberries to garnish. Delicious. But you also had a Cosmo. And a Cosmopolitan was something that had not only vodka, triple sec, cranberry juice, fresh lime juice, and a slice of lime and shaken with ice. This was something that was not only refreshing, but something that was a little more sophisticated. And of course, my favorite, the Cape Cotter. And the Cape Cotter is a cocktail consisting of vodka and cranberry juice. Originally, it was called the Red Devil. And rumors suggested it actually got its start at the bars of Cape Cod in the summer. However, there are multiple variations of the drink, starting with the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. This cocktail, the Kennedy, is named after the Kennedy family matriarch and mother of John F. Kennedy. And the recipe is similar to the traditional Cape Codder, except it also adds club soda, probably for her effervescent personality. And of course, there was the Scarlet O'Hara. We all knew about Gone with the Wind, but this was something that was started at a restaurant in New Orleans called Brennan's French Restaurant. And of course, it was a drink of the Old South. So it was the juice of a half a fresh lime, ocean spray cranberry juice, and two ounces of Southern Comfort, shaken with cracked ice and strained into a glass. It was something that kicked a punch. But we realize in some ways it's not just alcohol. We even have herbal teas. And of course, cranberry herbal tea is something we think, of course, is going to let us soothly actually fall to sleep in the evening. And seen here for a cover of celestial herbal tea, it's something that's not only a pleasant sight, but we've seen cranberries larger <laughs> than we've ever seen before in the foreground. And of course, we might even take cranberry fruit concentrate. And it says, here's to your health, Puritan's pride, cranberry fruit concentrate with vitamin C and E, 42,000 meg megabytes. In this instance, it was not just cranberries and drinks and tea and, of course, concentrate. But we realized that this print of the 18th century as a horticultural print showing the crane berry, as it was named by John Eliot, is something in some ways that would actually be developed not just for typical use, but by the 20th century, a major part of the food industry. Cranberries themselves can be utilized in a variety of sources, and I call it nature's harvest. In that instance, it's something that not only is New England's bounty, but as nature's harvest, we realize how much it can actually offer us. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.